Geometric algebra, or Clifford algebra, is one of these topics in math that's really underappreciated, and there's not a lot of good stuff out there on YouTube. So what I thought I'd do in this video is help you guys get your feet wet with some of the concepts of geometric and Clifford algebra, uh, specifically in two dimensions. We're going to really intensively study the plane in this video, and we're also going to see that the concepts of the complex numbers will pop right out of that study of the plane. So the background space here, the background vector space, is just going to be R2, just the plane. Now to concretely engage in the study, we're going to have to pick some privileged vectors to serve as what's called the basis for R2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cook up two vectors. The first one's going to be called E1, which is just going to be some vector going to the right. And I'm going to cook up a second vector called E2, which is going to be this vertical vector. And I've chosen both of these so that both E1 and E2 are of length 1. And furthermore, E1 is perpendicular to E2. So what I've done here is I've just picked two vectors out of the, out of the space. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to base all other vectors off these vectors, E1 and E2. And by basing all other vectors off E1 and E2, this is what's called taking a linear combination of the basis vectors E1 and E2. For example, I could cook up some vector v, which is going to be e1 minus e2. And graphically, that would look like this. If e2 is in that direction, minus e2 is going to look something like that. And v is going to be given by the sum of that vector and this vector, which you just add in the, in the normal vector way by the parallelogram rule to get that vector v. So I'm going to think of e1 and e2 as the basis, and all other vectors are going to be linear combinations of E1 and E2. Just standard linear algebra stuff. Uh, we're interested in doing some operations with these vectors. And one operation that you're probably already familiar with that we're going to use in geometric algebra is called the dot product. Now conceptually what we're doing here with the dot product is taking in two vectors, so two inputs, both of them vectors, and the output is going to be a scalar, just some number. And let's say u is given in terms of the basis, e1 and e2. So u is going to be equal to some scalar called a times e1 plus another scalar b times e2. And along the same lines, v is going to be some scalar c times e1 plus d times e2. The dot product u dot v, it's written like that, u dot v, is going to be equal to the product of the first components, which is going to be ac, plus the product of the second components, bd. So just a bit of review there. Dot product is a very simple operation. As I said, it takes in two vectors and returns a scalar. Pretty simple operation, but also a very important operation for a number of different reasons. One reason is that it relates to projections. It tells you how much of a certain vector is in the same direction as another vector. Uh, another important thing to know about the dot product, if, if you don't already know this, is that if I have two vectors u and v, and let's say u and v are perpendicular or orthogonal, the dot product goes to zero in that case. In fact, you might define orthogonality as precisely this, as the dot product goes to zero. Another thing to be familiar with, too, is that if I have some vectors u and v again, the dot product commutes. That is, u dot v is the same thing as v dot u. And that can be easily proven by doing the calculation here. And yet another thing to know is if you take the dot product of a vector with itself, let's say u dot u, this is equal to the magnitude of u squared. And again, that can be proven using the computation here. So hopefully the dot product is quite familiar to most people. Now, if I ask you for another operation that we could do upon vectors, you might say to me, well, we could do the cross product too. That's a good idea, but we're working in two dimensions here. And the cross product's only good in three dimensions. It's kind of a weird dude. He's only good in three dimensions. He can't do much else. But I've got an even cooler operation for you. That It's one that you may not be familiar with. It's called the wedge product. And since you may not be familiar with this, let me attempt to explain what it is. So the wedge product is going to be symbolized by u wedge v with this, this upward uh, triangle symbol. And what u wedge v is, is going to be a mathematical object composed of completing the parallelogram where u and v serve as the two sides of the parallelogram. So the magnitude of u wedge v is going to be the amount of area enclosed in this parallelogram. And furthermore, u wedge v is going to have a certain orientation associated with it. 
uh, the fact that I said u wedge v as opposed to v wedge u is going to be symbolized by a counterclockwise circulation. And it's, it's counterclockwise because I was going in the order u v. So that's kind of in the counterclockwise direction, so I'm going to symbolize it like that. And that's to distinguish it from v wedge u, which is actually going to have opposite orientation. If I were to draw in v wedge u, I would draw a clockwise circulation there. So this u wedge v, you can think of it as an area which has orientation and it has magnitude. So it's kind of a neat little operation, and this is actually good for any number of dimensions, as opposed to the cross product, which is only good for three dimensions. These oriented areas that I've been talking about are also called bivectors. And hopefully you can see why they're called bivectors, because they're formed by joining up two vectors together to form these oriented areas. And now I'd like to tell you about some of the, the properties of, these, of this wedge product. One of the most important properties is that you wedged with u, any vector wedged with itself is going to be zero. Now, why is that a reasonable thing to say? Well, remember, we're concerned with the magnitude of this area enclosed within the parallelogram. So if I take some vector u and another vector, the same one, u, how much area is enclosed in that parallelogram? That's zero. Notice, too, that this is very similar to the cross product, too. If you cross a vector with itself, it's, it goes to the zero vector. And another property that this wedge product shares with the cross product is if I take u wedge v, that's actually equal to minus v wedge u. And those are the two important properties of the wedge product I'd like you to know about, that a vector wedge with itself is zero, and that the wedge product is what's called anti-commutative. That means when you switch the order of the two vectors, you got to stick in the minus sign there. So u wedge v is minus v wedge u. And going back to the pictures, if u wedge v was this oriented area, this parallelogram here, this area with a counterclockwise circulation, v wedge u has the same amount of area, the same absolute value. It just has an opposite orientation as a, as a clockwise circulation there. And there's actually quite a lot you can do with these two concepts here. And to show you that, let's consider two arbitrary vectors in the plane. u is going to be equal to, again, a times e1 plus b times e2. And v is going to be c times e1 plus d times e2. And what we're going to do now is we're going to, we're going to consider u wedge v, which just to write out is a e1 plus b e2 wedged with c e1 plus d e2. Another assumption, too, that we're building into this wedge product is that it behaves nicely. That, for example, now I'm going to distribute it. And so that's one assumption I have to build in. So I'm going to do precisely that. I'm going to distribute. I'm going to take this term here, and I'm going to wedge it with this term here. And I also have an assumption that I can pull scalars out. So I can take these A's and C's and move them around as I like. So I'm going to write this product of the, this wedge product of, the, of this term and this term as AC times E1 wedge E1. And I'm going to do a similar sort of thing with all the other terms. So I'm going to have AE1 wedged with DE2. I'm going to pull the scalar out. I'm going to write AD times E1 wedge E2. For the next term, I have BE2 wedged with CE1. So it's going to be BC times E2 wedge E1. And the final term is going to be BE2 wedged with DE2. So it's going to be B2 E2 wedge E2. And now we're going to use this first property that a vector wedge with itself is going to go to zero. So that gets rid of that term and that term, because that was E1 wedge E1, and that term was E2 wedge E2. So that, that leaves me with AD E1 wedge E2. But now I'm going to take a look at this term. I'm going to actually use this property that if I flip the order here, i got to stick a minus sign in. So I'm going to write this as minus BC E1 wedge e2. And I'm going to just combine the coefficients here. And what I'm left with is this very interesting quantity, ad minus bc, that scalar, times e1 wedge e2. So I say that this scalar that we're getting out front is indeed very interesting because it shows up in, in many different ways in math. You may recognize this ad minus bc as the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix where the columns 
are the two vectors, A, B in the first column, and C, D in the second column. So the determinant of this thing is indeed A, D minus B, C. And you also know that one interpretation of the determinant is the what we were saying before. It's the area of the parallelogram formed by the two column vectors, or row vectors, the same determinant. So that's one interpretation of this quantity, AD minus BC. Another one is that if you really, really want to take that cross product, you could consider this vector to be AB0, where 0 is just going to be the Z component, and A and B are the XY components. And then this, this vector here is going to be CD0. If you take the cross product between those two, the answer you're going to get is purely in the Z direction. And the magnitude, or I should say the component in the z direction, is AD minus BC. So that's yet another interpretation of this quantity, AD minus BC. But the key point is that taking the wedge product, its magnitude, this AD minus BC, that's indeed the area of the parallelogram formed by those two vectors. So hopefully that business about the wedge product is fairly clear. It's often a topic introduced in, in higher math, but as you can see, it's not that tough. Uh, you can certainly learn this if you know about vectors. But now I'd like to move on to another kind of product, and this is one of the big innovations of math, that I think it was Clifford who had this idea of defining a new kind of product called the geometric product, which is going to be the sum of the dot product between two vectors and the wedge product between two vectors. So let's say I had two vectors, u and v. The geometric product, uv, is going to be defined to be u dot v, that's the, the dot product there, plus u wedge v. And that's the definition of the geometric product. Now you may ask, uh, what's the motivation for doing something like this? Uh, I guess there are many reasons. Uh, one particular reason that I like, and a lot of you guys know that I, I do videos on quaternions, this is very similar to how two quaternions are being multiplied by one another, uh, given that their scalar part goes to zero. Actually, when you do quaternions, you actually get a minus u dot v, plus u cross v, so this form is kind of similar to that. Now this geometric product is the, the fundamental operation in geometric algebra, and let's play around with this a little bit. Let's say I had the geometric product between a vector and itself, so let's say u and u, which I'm going to write as just plain old u squared. So let's plug that into this formula and see what happens. So we get u dot u plus u wedge u. What's u wedge u? That goes to zero. So I'm left with u squared is equal to u dot u. But remember when u, a vector dotted with itself is, that's the magnitude squared of that vector. So u squared, where this side is the geometric product, is equal to a scalar, just a pure scalar, which is the squared magnitude. So that's one interesting thing. Another one is, let's say we had two vectors, and they're perpendicular. Let's say that's u and that's v. And let's take the geometric product between the two, u, v. So again, we have u dot v plus u wedge v. Now, what happens here? The two vectors are orthogonal. So that means the dot product part disappears, and we're left with the wedge product only. So in this case, when two vectors are orthogonal, their geometric product is the same thing as the wedge product. I should also point out that, in general, the geometric product is neither commutative nor anti-commutative. And I leave these two statements for you to prove as an exercise, just to test your understanding of the dot product and the wedge product, that if u and v are in the same direction, then uv is equal to vu, that the geometric product commutes. And the second statement is, if u and v are orthogonal, so we get something like this going on, then uv is equal to minus vu. This is the anti-commuting case. But in general, the geometric product is neither of the two. The vectors don't have to necessarily line up, that is, be parallel, or be orthogonal. Another conceptual thing to point out with this geometric product is that the inputs are two vectors, u and v, remember those are just two vectors, but the output is something a bit different. It's the sum of a scalar, because remember, the dot product just gives me a scalar, with a bivector. So this is quite interesting. We have these these one-dimensional objects that we're inputting into the geometric product, and what we're getting out is a zero-dimensional object, which is a scalar, and a two-dimensional object, which is that bivector, that oriented area that we're talking about. So this is actually a pretty interesting operation. It's quite different than something you might have seen before in vector analysis. At this point, let me write out the geometric product as full generality. 
So let's say we had some vector u, which is, as before, a times e1 plus b times e2. And we had another vector v, which is c times e1 plus d times e2. So the geometric product uv is going to be the sum of the dot product and the wedge product. And we've calculated these two already, so I'll just go up right ahead and fill them in. So the dot product was that scalar ac plus bd. And by the way, this scalar would be called, in the lingo of geometric algebra, this would be a grade zero object in the geometric algebra, plus what's called a grade two object. And we've already calculated that, so I'll just write it in. AD minus BC times E1 wedge E2, that, that by vector there. Let me be even more concrete by doing some calculations using the geometric product with the basis vectors. Remember those were E1, which is a unit vector pointing to the right, and a vector orthogonal to it going in a vertical direction called E2. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take E1 and take the geometric product with itself. Remember what that is? That's E1 dot E1 plus E1 wedge E1. Since it's a vector wedge with itself, that part goes away. What's this dot product going to be equal to? This is the squared magnitude of E1. Remember we said that E1 is going to be of length 1, so this whole thing is 1. And this E1 times E1, I'm just going to write as E1 squared. So that's actually an important property right there, that E1 squares to positive 1. Now you can run the same argument with E2, and you're going to find, correspondingly, that E2 squared is also positive 1. So that's pretty interesting. Now what happens if we consider something like E1 times E2? If we take the geometric product between E1 and E2. So let's write that out. We have E1 dot E2 plus E1 wedge E2. Now remember we set these basis vectors up to be orthogonal. So that means that the dot product part goes away. So what that means is that E1 times E2 is exactly the same thing as that by vector that we've been talking about, that oriented area. And again, just to imagine this whole thing visually, I have an E1 there, I have the E2 there, and I form the parallelogram with those two vectors at its sides. I look at the order E1, E2. So E1, E2, that means it's going to be counterclockwise. So I'm going to draw the circulation symbol like that. And this new by vector object with its orientation is exactly equal to E1, E2. Now what if, instead of considering E1 times E2, I consider E2 times E1? Now I claim that the case is pretty similar. These two vectors are orthogonal, so that means the dot product disappears. And what you're going to be left with, instead of E1, wedge E2, is actually going to be E2, wedge E1. Which, remember, I can flip these around to write E1, wedge E2, but I've got to stick that minus sign in there. But up here, I found that E1 wedge E2 is equal to E1 E2. So I find the other important property that E1 E2 is the opposite of E2 E1, which is to say that when you set up the basis vectors like this, they anti-commute with respect to the geometric product. These are the important properties that we've found so far that the basis elements E1 and E2 squared to positive 1, and also that E1 times E2, if you want to flip the order of that, you've got to stick a minus sign in there. So E1, E2 is anti-commutative. Now, we are considering the squares of E1 here, but what if we consider the square of E1, E2? What's that going to be equal to? Well, just writing this out, this is going to be E1 times E2 times e1, e2. Now this is something we haven't encountered before, taking the geometric product of, of multiple things, but it turns out that the geometric product is very nicely behaved. I can use the associative rule, I can distribute the geometric product, I can yank constants out, more or less anything you, you would think that we can naturally do, except commute it, is going to apply to the geometric product. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to analyze this thing, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this E1, E2, 
I'm going to use this property that I derived here to flip the order. So I'm going to have instead of E1, E2, I'm going to have E2, E1. Then I have E1, E2. But remember that minus sign there. And now I take a look at this. The E1s are together. So what I get here is minus E2 times E1 squared times E2. What's E1 squared? That's equal to plus 1. So I'm left with minus E2, E2, which is also minus E2 squared. What's E2 squared? That's equal to plus 1. So I'm left with minus 1. So what I get is that E1, E2 squared is minus 1. Now hopefully that squaring to minus 1 thing rings a few bells with respect to complex numbers. Because remember in the complex numbers, the big innovation there is that you have this thing called i, which squares to minus 1. Which is something, it's a property that no real number has. And what, what, remember that this e1, e2 was also a bivector. We found that e1, e2 was equal to the bivector e1, y, g2. So when we're talking about the geometric product, if you want to think of this parallelogram, which is e1, y, g2, this thing, when you feed it into the geometric product, squares to minus 1. In light of our discovery that e1, e2, or e1, y, g2, squares to minus 1, I'm going to adopt a pretty suggestive notation. I'm going to call e1 times e2 big I. And hopefully you can see why I'm doing that, because this thing squares to minus 1, just like the, the ordinary imaginary unit squares to minus 1. Well, let's review the, the sorts of mathematical objects that we've been encountering in our study of the geometric algebra of R2 of the plane, which is often symbolized like this, G of R2. First, we had those vectors, and we had two of those. We had E1 and E2, which we, had, we gave a natural physical interpretation as two arrows, two directed line segments. And we saw that if we want to do some common vector operations like the dot product, we needed to throw in some scalars too. For example, if we want to take E1 dot e2 or e1 dot e1 we needed to put some scalars in there which i'll symbolize by just one and the last thing that we discovered were the bivectors, vectors which were going to be of the form e1 wedge e2 which by the way we give it we gave that a couple different names we gave that the name e1 wedge e2 or e1 times e2 or also i and remember that the, the geometric interpretation of the bivector was the area with an orientation. So E1 times E2 would look like this, this parallelogram with a counterclockwise circulation. So we see that in terms of the number of mathematical objects that we had, we had one scalar, two vectors, and one bivector. So we can say that the geometric algebra of R2 that its dimension is equal to 4. So this is a four-dimensional vector space. And speaking of this four-dimensional abstract vector space, the basis of this vector space would be given by each of these four types of mathematical object. We have the scalar, we had E1 and E2, which were our vectors or the grade 1 objects. The scalar was our grade 0. And then the grade 2 object was just I. So this set forms a basis for the geometric algebra of R2, that's four-dimensional, and any object in this vector space can be written as a linear combination of each one of these types of objects. And actually these types of objects are called multi-vectors, and maybe I'll get to those in the future video, but it's just some combination of a scalar, a vector, and a bivector. Let me start to wrap up this video by discussing one aspect of complex numbers that they're really famous for, which is doing rotations in two dimensions. Now, if you had some complex number, let's say a plus bi, I'm going to use a lowercase i because we're, we're just going to go back to our knowledge of complex numbers. We're going to forget about geometric algebra for a second. You can think of this a plus bi as being some point on the real and imaginary plane. And the way you rotate this thing is to multiply on the left by e to the theta times i. Another way to write that is just by using Euler's formula, cosine theta plus sine theta times i, 
multiplied by a plus bi. And the action of this e to the theta i on a plus bi, when multiplying either from the left or from the right, is to rotate a plus bi. And let me work out what that formula is. The new real part is going to be a times cosine theta. The, and then we're going to have a minus b sine theta. And then a new imaginary part is going to be composed of a sine theta plus b cosine theta. Just distributing all this stuff here. And that's all times i. I should point out that we commonly think of complex numbers as vectors. And these vectors are encapsulated by writing a plus bi. But in light of our discussion of geometric algebra, if we were to write down something like a plus bi, we saw before that this imaginary unit isn't really a vector, but a bi vector. So when we think of something like a plus bi, perhaps we shouldn't think of a vector with coordinates a, b. Perhaps we should think of something like this, a scalar called a plus b times a bi vector, also called i, but I'll write it out in another way, e1, e2. Now th this is a different point of view. It's a scalar plus a bi vector, whereas here, this complex number is just being interpreted as a vector. This new way of thinking of the complex numbers as a scalar plus a bi vector is of course slightly different than the vectors that we're used to, but you can do all the computations you want with this point of view or with this point of view, you're gonna get the same answer. Put in slightly fancier terms, the mathematical objects formed by a linear combination of the scalars and of the bi vectors is isomorphic to the complex numbers. Let me attempt to further convince you that this E1, E2 thing actually does have something to do with complex numbers. So this bi vector actually has something to do with the imaginary unit. And to do that, let's go back to our arbitrary vector u, which was a times e1 plus b times e2. So if we were to think geometrically, two dimensions, this might look something like this. There's u. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the geometric product u with i, i being multiplied on the right. So this is going to be equal to a e1 plus b e2 times i, which was e1 e2. So I'm just going to distribute as I would normally expect to be able to do. So I'm going to have a times e1 e1 e2. Now this is important when you distribute to keep the order correct. It's e1 e1 e2. And then my second term is going to be b e2 e1 e2. So 2 1 2. And now I just use the properties that I'm familiar with. I see that I have an e1 times an e1. That's e1 squared. What's that equal to? That's plus 1. So here I'm left with a times e2. And what's going on over here? Now I have a e2, e1, e2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the order of these two. So I'm going to get b, e1, e2, e2. But I've got to stick a minus sign there. And I'm left with minus b, but I have this e2 times e2 here, that's e2 squared, which is just plus 1. So I'm left with e1. And I could just flip those terms around, so I get minus b e1 plus a e2. So look at what's, what's going on here. My input vector was a e1 plus b e2, and then the output vector is minus b e1 plus a times e2. So just writing in terms of coordinates, AB gets mapped, and the mapping is multiplying on the right by E1, E2, or I, that gets mapped to minus B, A. Now if you remember your elementary transformations, AB going to minus B, A is a rotation by 90 degrees counterclockwise. So if I call this input vector U, and if I call this output U prime, u gets mapped to u prime by rotating 90 degrees counterclockwise. So that is how the imaginary unit behaves. When you multiply by i, that does a rotation by 90 degrees. In this case, we had to multiply on the right to get this sort of effect. And the complex numbers, it wouldn't have mattered because complex numbers, the, the multiplication is commutative. But here, the action of multiplying by i on the right 
is a rotation by 90 degrees counterclockwise. And if you go through the calculations again, if you instead multiply on the left by I, you'll find a different effect. It won't be this one, but I'll let you discover what that is. It is a rotation, by the way. So we see that the effect of multiplying by I on the right is a rotation of the vector 90 degrees counterclockwise, but what if I want to rotate by some arbitrary angle of theta counterclockwise? Well, what do we do with the complex numbers? Like I said before, we would have something like a plus bi being multiplied either on the left or by the right by e to the theta i. And the e to the theta i, that was just cosine theta plus sine theta times i. Now let's take the same hint from ordinary complex numbers and try to apply that to geometric algebra. So let's go back to our arbitrary vector u, which I said was a times e1 plus b times e2. And let, let's continue multiplying on the right since that, that seemed to work before. Now, instead of multiplying by just e1, e2, which is that i, we're going to take a hint from this and try multiplying by cosine theta by the scalar plus sine theta times the by vector i. And let's compute with this. Now remember, I wrote i there, but that's also e1, e2. And let's see what we get. We're going to multiply this by this first. And remember, I can yank those constant, I can yank those scalars around as I want. So I'm going to get a times cosine theta times e1. And then I'm going to get a times e1 times sine theta times e1, e2. So that's a sine theta, e1, e1, e2. And I'm going to get b cosine theta times e2. And my last one is going to be this times this, which is going to be b sine theta. And then I have e2, e1, e2. Just following the order, e2, e1, e2. And let me simplify this. I have a cosine theta times e1. What's going on with the second term? I have e1, e1. e1 squared is just 1, so I'm going to get rid of those. I get plus a sine theta times e2. I have this term over here, plus b cosine theta times e2. And my last one, I have e2, e1, e2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the order of these two. But that's going to come with a minus sign. When I flip the order, I'm going to get e2 times e2, which is just going to be 1. So I'm actually going to be left with minus b sine theta e1. And then I just combine the like terms. I have an e1 here and an e1 there. So I get a cosine theta minus b sine theta all times e1. So that's the new first component of the vector after being rotated. And then I combine the e2s together. So I get a sine theta plus b cosine theta all times e2. So if I call this one u over here, this would be the newly rotated vector. Let's call it u prime. And hopefully you can see this is exactly how the complex numbers work out, that these coefficients for e1 and e2 are the exact same thing. But the conceptual difference here is that the thing doing the rotating is a scalar plus a bi vector. In fact, we can do even better if we go back to this cosine theta plus sine theta times i. We can use Euler's formula to write that thing as e to the theta times big I, just using Euler's formula. And then we can say that if we have some starting vector, let's say u, if we take the geometric product u times e to the theta i, that's equal to the newly rotated vector u prime, which is going to be given by this vector that we just calculated. So now we see that the thing doing the rotating is the exponential of a vi vector. Remember what this i was? We actually gave a, a geometric interpretation of this, this i thing. That was the by vector formed by wedging e1 with e2. So that's going to look something like this, this oriented area. As always, there's much more to say on this topic, but hopefully you've enjoyed this introductory video on the, the geometric algebra of R2, of the plane. And hopefully you've gotten your feet wet with some of these concepts, especially the wedge products these bi vectors, and hopefully you've also seen how this imaginary unit 
uh, this concept of squaring to minus one isn't really something foreign at all. It's it's baked right into the the geometry of of R two. And as always, uh, if you enjoyed the content, feel free to subscribe to my channel, comment on the videos, like the video, blah blah blah, and I hope you stay tuned for future videos. Thanks for watching.